Okay, so who's responsible for all this uh, turbulence and laminar flow and, and the, the values and how you predict it? Well, it's a man called Osborne Reynolds, who in 1883 published this famous paper entitled An Experimental Investigation of the Circumstances Which Determine Whether Motion of Water Shall Be Direct or Sinuous and the Law of Resistance in Parallel Channels, which is quite a mouthful. But uh, it's also quite an interesting paper. And as I previously mentioned, he had some very interesting results. Low flow rates, at low flow rates, he noticed that two times the flow gave, gave double the pressure, and at high flow rates, two times the flow gave four times the pressure. And he set about trying to work out how to, how to predict when this would be the case and when that would be the case. And that, that's, that's what his research, that's the direction his research took. And based on his research, other people started examining and experimenting, and they named the trans transitional numbers that he actually came up with Reynolds numbers in memory of the guy. So the Reynolds number is actually the number that predicts the extent of turbulence from experimental data. And it actually depends on how fast the fluid is flowing, which is Q for flow rate, the geometry of the flow, which is D um, in this equation, as in it, it could be either the depth of a channel or it could be the diameter of the, uh, the diameter of a pipe or the, di the equivalent diameter of an annulus. And the density of the fluid, which is rho, density of the fluid, and also the viscosity of that fluid, which is uh, the symbol mu. Re is the normal notation for the Reynolds number. And uh, the Reynolds number can basically be viewed as inertial forces divided by viscous forces. Inertia being the resistance to change in motion, and inertial forces tend to make, make the water keep flowing if it's misdirected from, the, misdirected from the main flow direction. So it's basically it's trying to keep flowing in the direction that it's traveling in, and it's trying to keep flowing at the same rate that it's traveling. And so inertia is what's trying to keep it in that direction. So high inertial forces tend to cause more turbulence. Uh, basically, so if you're basically coming around a bend or you're going from one, uh, basically if you're changing the direction of the flow, then the, uh, the inertial forces will be trying to force the molecules in this direction where they're trying to turn and you'll end up with turbulence occurring much, much more easily if you've got high inertial forces. And inertial forces are pretty much um, dependent on the density of the fluid, which is uh, one of the things that you should bear in mind here. Um, in contrast, the viscous forces tend to suppress turbulence by damping out variations in the motion through friction. So although the fluid's maybe trying to change direction and then it's beginning to try and become turbulent because of its density, if it's very viscous, very thick, then it's not going to be able to become turbulent. It will tend to, the, 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 this chaotic motion will be damped by the friction within the fluid. So it will, it will not become turbulent so easily if it's more viscous. So a flow with a high viscosity like ice tends to have, a, have less turbulence than a low viscosity flow like air. As in if you, look, uh, if you looked at that um, smoke column earlier, it's very, very easy for it to break into turbulence from a laminar flow. Very, very, very quickly it'll, it'll do that because the uh, viscosity of the air around it and the viscosity of the smoke is, is actually very, very low. Um, whereas the, uh, a flow of ice, or you could use mayonnaise, tomato sauce, that sort of thing, tar, that sort of flow, it's very, very, very viscous, therefore it, it's very difficult to break it into turbulence because it's, it's resisting, it's basically damping out to the turbulent motion, regardless of whether it's changing direction and so on. Now that, to summarize that in, a, in an equation, uh, as I said, it's uh, fluid inertial forces divided by fluid viscous forces. Now, inertial forces are basically your geometry or your depth of the channel, or uh, that could be pipe diameter. Q being your flow rate or flow velocity, fluid velocity. Uh, rho being the density, and that's your, your inertial forces on the top. The size of it, how fast it's moving, and also how heavy it is, if you like. These are the things that are trying to keep it moving in a straight line. And on the bottom of here, we've got uh, viscosity, mu, which is drawing that, uh, basically counteracting the inertial forces by 
fric using friction to dampen the effects of these out. So that's what this equation is basically saying to you. Now the units of the Reynolds number, it all cancels out to form pretty much a dimensionless number. So the Reynolds number hasn't, it hasn't got any units, it's just a number. But it's something that can be calculated, it's something our software calculates to work out whether you've got turbulent flow or laminar flow. Now basically the onset of turbulence occurs quicker if the density of the fluid's increased, if the flow rate's increased, or if the channel depth or pipe diameter is increased. Obviously they're on the top of the equation. If you increase any of these or all of them, then the num this number will become larger. If the viscosity is increased, as in this number here, mu on the bottom, then Reynolds number decreases, meaning that thicker fluids tend towards turbulence less easily. So you increase the viscosity, this becomes the Reynolds number becomes lower because you're dividing all of these by a larger number, so the Reynolds number becomes lower. And if there's a critical Reynolds number, a number that uh, has to be passed to, for the onset of turbulence to occur, if you can bring that down by increasing the viscosity, then it won't go into turbulent flow. If you then increase, say, the fluid density and maintain the viscosity, this will become larger and eventually it may, over, it may go over that critical Reynolds number and break into turbulence. And similarly, if you increase the depth of the, the depth of the river, as in that photograph that I showed you earlier of the laminar to turbulent flow, when it went into a deeper area, it suddenly broke into chaotic motion, just purely because D had changed. Also, the direction of Q had changed slightly as well. The other thing to mention here is that if you increase the rate at which you're pumping or the fluid velocity, then you will also get achieve turbulence quicker. And it's usually... Um, the Q value that we think of as, as, the, as the point where uh, the, the driving force behind uh, turbulence occurring because density is usually fairly constant and uh, the geometry is usually fairly constant as well. Um, and it's usually the flow rate that we consider as being the, the thing that brings turbulence on. But we have to remember that all of these things together are what, uh, what governs the regime that we're in. Now the magnitude of the Reynolds number gives an idea of whether the flow is turbulent or laminar. Turbulent flow has a Reynolds number of greater than 2100 and true laminar flow has a Reynolds number of less than 500 um, for most drilling fluids. Now that's a bit of a generalization to say the least but the source of that uh, statement is actually the API RP13D, the American Petroleum Institute's recommended practice number 13D, the third edition just to give you sort of an idea of the numbers that, that we're going to be dealing with. You were talking somewhere in the region of a few hundred to quite a few thousand as a Reynolds number. And when, you, when we're calculating this, or when our computers are calculating this, basically, this is the sort of values, these are the sort of values it should be coming out with. Now the uh, flow with a Reynolds number between 500 and 2100 in this general case is transitional and therefore has some characteristics of laminar flow but some turbulence as well as I mentioned earlier. Now water and air flows have high Reynolds numbers because D is large um, you know as you've got basically usually river channels are fairly deep and wide um, you know in a room you've got a lot of space for the air to move around so D is large, Q is usually quite high as well and the viscosity is low um, the viscosity of water is only one centipoise, if I remember back to one of the previous modules. The viscosity of air is way less than that. It's, um, it's almost unnoticeable most of the time. So uh, turbulence, uh, well, the Reynolds numbers for water and air tend to be quite high uh, for most flows in water and air. Now, when you calculate Reynolds numbers for a particular hole section, you could then say, okay, if it's greater than 2100, then the flow regime is probably turbulent for water and Bingham fluids. If you're looking at pseudoplastic fluids, power law type fluids, then you use this 4270 minus 1370 times N. So the N being the uh, um, power law index. If it's greater than 4,270 minus 1,370 times N, then the flow regime is probably turbulent for pseudoplastic fluids. Now, rivers and windstorms are 
good examples of turbulent flow. In contrast, ice has a large viscosity and, and flows slowly, so Q is very low. So it's a laminar flow and also very thin, slow flows of water, such as water flowing off a smooth surface, has a low Reynolds number because D and Q are small, so it can also be laminar. Laminar flow also occurs locally within turbulent flows, as I said before, at the contact between the fluid and, and a smooth surface, as in the annular wall or the pipe wall, uh, because basically the flow rate at that point becomes very, very slow. So it becomes laminar towards the outside of the turbulent flow.